Welcome to the final episode of Series 24, everyone. Lucian Khan returns to talk about his game, Visigoths vs. Molgoths. But before we get to that amazing discussion, first we'd like to lead with some announcements. First things first, Descent into Midnight launched their Kickstarter this last Saturday, and we're really happy and ecstatic to tell you that the game has fully funded in just under 18 hours after launch, which is absolutely remarkable. Congratulations to the Descent into Midnight team. It was a remarkable push by a remarkable crew, and they deserve all the success in the world. This game is something very special, uh, it's so special to myself and to Amelia. Uh, so if you have not checked it out yet, please head over to dimrpg.io slash ks to get in on the amazing Kickstarter. Right now, they're pushing for stretch goals every $5,000 raised beyond the initial goal. And every stretch goal will unlock a new episode of a Descent into Midnight campaign run by the talented Steampunks crew headed by Eric Campbell, uh, which is in addition to the normal stretch goals. And this first stretch goal, a Descent into Midnight themed coloring book, which is an absolutely amazing idea. So definitely check them out. Speaking of Descent into Midnight, we've got a bonus spotlight episode coming up this week with special guest Rich Howard. So keep an ear out for that. We loved having Richard Kreutzlandry and Taylor Labresh on for our Descent into Midnight series back in series 18. So it's delightful that I had a chance to sit down with Rich Howard to complete the developer set, so to speak. Finally, if you like what we are doing here, please consider leaving us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you are able to leave reviews. They really help us out and they always brighten up our days. We're running low on reviews to read when we can read view reviews together. So even just a quick C3 good or a five star rating would be very helpful and would help get our podcast recommended to more people due to the almighty algorithm. For now, though, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to our discussion episode. Last time, we created characters for Visigoths versus Molgoths. This episode, we're discussing the character creation process. We're very excited to welcome back Lucian Khan, designer of Visigoths versus Molgoths. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself again for everyone and tell us a little bit about the character you made in the last episode? Hi, um, so my name is Lucian Khan. I am the designer of Visigoths vs. Molgoths, um, and also several other role-playing games, such as Dead Friend, a game of necromancy, Grandma's Drinking Song, and other games. Um, and I made a character named Velvet, who is a theater tech Molgoth. Um, he is very vampire style, so he wears a um, long red velvet cape made out of um, the same material as theater curtains. It has a high collar. Um, he um, really um, likes to express his emotions very dramatically, um, <laughs> such as the time that um, he... Uh, didn't like um, his friend's um, little squeaky toy of a <laughs> fire hydrant, so lit it on fire and said, oh, I have to make you more futuristic toys. <laughs> um, so he's he's got a flair for the dramatic. That's amazing. I, I, that's love, velvet. I love that you set fire to a fire hydrant. I did. <laughs> Let's see it try to be a hydrant now. <laughs> amazing. Uh, Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? Sure. Um, I created Gilvira, 
who is a Visigoth rune caster, uh, she also wears a cape and is not happy that Velvet has stolen her look um, and, uh, you know, can levitate and uh, be invisible and cool stuff. Um, and definitely one time saw Luna graffitiing some bad poetry on the wall and is not about that. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? <laughs> well, uh, I made the aforementioned Luna. Uh, she is a cyber pet, uh, which means uh, she dresses up in uh, very fashionable, futuristic-esque uh, animal outfits. Um, and she she likes to be uh, Velvet's pet because of those future toys. But, uh, you know... Even though Jelfira kind of levitates and that weirds her out a bit, she's kind of got a crush on her. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our discussion segment that we call D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? All right. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. Uh, but first, we'd like to get to know our guests a bit better. So we are going to get the cliche question out of the way. Uh, can you tell us how you got into RPGs in the first place? And uh, in addition to that, how you got into game design? Okay, so the answer to how I got into RPGs is sort of a two-pronged answer, um, because it depends on whether you want to start with how I got into computer RPGs or how I got into LARPs and tabletops. And I'm going to give both answers because they're both interesting. Um, so when I was nine years old, um, the first Final Fantasy game came out for the NES, um, <laughs> and my cousin got it for Hanukkah. Um, and <laughs> this is really what happened. <laughs> and, um, it, we were on winter break. Um, and so my cousin and I just spent like 80 million hours <laughs> playing the original Final Fantasy. Oh, yeah. And it was the first time we had seen anything like it. We didn't know anything about role-playing games. We didn't know anything about strategy. Um, and it was like extremely hard, right? Really, really hard. Oh, yeah. um, and so we just obsessed over it. Um, and then when I got home um, from visiting my cousins, I I convinced my mom to, to get it for me. And um, then I spent a year, um, more than a year, really obsessed with Final Fantasy. I got the Nintendo Power Strategy Guide. Um, <laughs> I made like elaborate charts in my journal of like <laughs> when I reached different landmarks in the game <laughs> and I still have it. I have this. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So I have this journal full of like charts in Pentel markers, like multicolored Pentel markers of like beat the ice cave. Like it's like that. Um, is this like so a, that, like an adventuring journal? Like you're like mountain climbing, you have like dated today. I beat the ice cave. <laughs> it's actually funnier than that because it's just my regular journal. So like, <laughs> so like also in on other pages, it's like here are the top five cutest boys in my class, right? <laughs> yes. And then and then it's like and then I beat Tiamat in the volcano, you know, like or whatever, right? <laughs> no, it's Carrie in the volcano and Tiamat in the whatever. Anyway, so um, so that's that's how I got into any of this at all. But then, um, like unrelatedly, when I was um, 15, I went to a performing arts camp for a few weeks for guitar because I was like in all these grunge rock bands and I played guitar. Um, and so I went to this performing arts camp, but most of the people in the performing arts camp were there for theater. And um, I very quickly got... Um, asked if I wanted to join the improv troupe because I'm funny. So they brought me into the improv troupe. And then these people in the improv troupe, these goths, were like, hey, um, we're all playing this game. It's it's secret that we're playing the game. It's a secret game. It's called Vampire the Masquerade. <laughs> <laughs> And you can't tell anybody that we're playing it, but in this game, you pretend to be a vampire, and like they explained to me what Vampire the Masquerade was, but they didn't quite explain it right. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I actually feel like their wrong explanation really helped me um, because, first of all, they told me that it's a secret game. Um, so I actually <laughs> thought for like many months that part of the concept of the masquerade in Vampire is not only that it's a secret that vampires 
are, exist in the world of the game, but I thought that part of how you play it is you're not supposed to tell other people that you're playing the game, <laughs> which like is actually a terrible idea and seems like it would cause disasters. And I don't re- recommend this at all. And it sounds very unsafe, but miraculously nothing bad happened. It was just really fun and weird. <laughs> um, so accidentally this did not cause a disaster. Um, but this was really fun because we were at this camp and like at any time you could just go up to any other person who was in the game and you could say like now we're in game and like start role playing if they agreed to it. Um, so you could just like go up to somebody at breakfast and be like in game. And then like, you're suddenly just like having a conversation in game. Um, this again, right. Not a great idea. Um, but also was really fun Um, Because nobody knew what they were doing when we were all 15. Um, So another thing that they told me that um, is not usually what people tell you, but um, is really actually very key to my like continuing understanding of role playing games is they told me that you are not trying to win. Right. Which I, which is actually really important to my development as a designer. They were like, the purpose of this is like, you're not trying to make decisions that are, that are going to be advantageous. You're actually just trying to act how your character would act and like see what happens. And I, I think the reason why they told me this is how you play the game is because I met these people in an improv troupe. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. But I just thought for like years and years that um, that LARPs and tabletop role playing games were always like this. Like I did not realize until many years later that anybody was actually trying to succeed in role playing games. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was actually really fun. Like I was like, Oh, this is a very interesting thing to do. Like, I'm just going to like really get into pretending to be this character and making bad decisions and seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and that continues to be, um, really central to how I play when I'm a, when I'm a player in a role playing game. And I try to communicate that as well in my designs that you can do that, right. That you don't actually have to, um, try to make advantageous choices. I love playing games like that. And I feel like it took me so long to, because I had the opposite experience of playing with people who are always like looking for the optimal outcome. And it took me a long time to realize that there were other ways to play and that I much preferred playing that other way. That Mm -hmm. it was a lot more fun for me to like, just see what happens rather than playing to win or for like that optimal result. Totally. And I think that 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 what you're describing is a very frequent experience, right? I think I think that because most games that we know about, um, you know, board games and, and um, you know, competitive sports and other kinds of games, um, like sort of have this built in assumption that you are trying to win, right? You're trying to, like, actually do well in the game. Um, and it's just by like, random luck um, that I happen to be introduced to role-playing games as like, no, this is different. You're actually just trying to play a character. Um, but it's a really fun way to play. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Hmm? Yeah. Especially in the 90s. Like, yeah. Uh, oh my God. It was it was just random luck. It was like, yeah. and I met some and I met some goths and they were in an improv troupe. And uh-huh. it was just like, this is what happened. Oh, those improv goths. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it was just like Visigoths, most, most small goths, improv goths. Improv goths, exactly. <laughs> That's the sequel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, obviously you can see how, you know the way that I got into role-playing games in the first place is very much reflected in in this game. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your process for picking a character, creating a character in any kind of role-playing game when you sit down to play? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, depending on the game, I first try to decide, do I want to play really close to home or do I want to play like very different from myself? Right. I I actually like consciously ask myself this question. Like, do I feel like playing the sort of character who's kind of like me, but an amped up more extra, like more flamboyant, even more daring, whatever version of myself Or do I want to give myself the challenge of playing the type of character who's nothing like I am in real life and like seeing how that plays out? So that's my first sort of 
decision tree. Um, and a lot of things sort of sort of spiral off them from there, right? If I'm going to play a character who's really similar to myself, then I'm going to go for the characters that are like the most jestery, the most bard-like, the most sort of like flamboyant jokesters, like flirtatious, um, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, but then, right, if I'm deciding, no, I'm in the mood to play somebody really different from myself, then I start to think about like, well, like what are some of my personality traits that um, are like really sort of core to who I am and what are some of the things that are like other options that are not like that right Mm -hmm. so I'll be like okay so what if instead of playing a character who um, like makes jokes all the time what if I were like super serious and took everything really seriously right or like what if I played somebody who was really interested in you know revenge or whatever right so I, I try to like examine my own personality and see like well what if this this trait were the opposite and try to lean in that direction Mm -hmm. very cool i feel like that's very self-reflective in a way that maybe a lot of us are not great at (laughs) (laughs) maybe i don't know (laughs) i i i tend toward i tend toward being like I if I'm in my like happy mode, I tend toward being like flamboyant and jokey and flirty. And if I'm in like some when you go to like your sad mode, right? A lot of people in their sad mode get like depressed or self-hating or whatever. When I go to my sad mode, I just get really philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> so like you'll know if I'm like in a bad mood or having a bad day or having a bad week, if I'm just like I go deep, deep, deep into like analysis and philosophy and theory. Um <laughs> So that's just kind of a temper temperament thing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's get into the discussion about this game in particular. Um, how do we think character creation in this game stacks up against other games that we have played? Is this for you or for this me? This is for all of us. Yes. Oh, great. Well, you talk first because I made the thing. So <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it definitely has a lot of that PBTA feel. Yeah. Of you know like picking from categories and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like the choices are really evocative of the genre, though. Like, the the things to pick from for the Visigoths or for the Malgoths mm-hmm. are, like, they're so quintessentially, like, the Malgoths especially, like, so quintessentially 90s and, like, gothy. I'm yeah. not going to say gothic, because that's different. Gothy. <laughs> 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 but they're really evocative of like those feelings and tropes and stuff, and I really like that. Mm-hmm. And I like that um, you can get into this without having read much of the materials itself, right. and and get a kind of uh, idea of what the settings like. Because the first thing that I looked at with this game was looking at the character sheets. Uh, Mm -hmm. and seeing that, are you still glowing from time travel question was like, okay, there, there's something interesting going on here and it has to do with time travel a little bit on these character types. So let me, let me look into that a bit more. And it, it really, uh, it really set up, uh, the setting without having to really dive into the, the materials in the book itself. Yeah, I think the the info that you get just in a little bit on the character sheet is gives us a lot about the game without mm-hmm. having to like touch the game at all. Yeah, exactly. I, I like how it's uh, it's it's minimalistic, but like at at a level that highlights the most important things that you'll be kind of hitting uh, from what it sounds like when you're playing the game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I definitely. I'm I'm glad you mentioned the minimalism. I I really I play tested this extensively um and i really tried to narrow down the character sheets to what is actually necessary um and you know if you want to embellish um on top of that of course you're free to but i wanted i wanted the character sheets to really highlight right what is what are the what are the parts of this character that are the most likely to be interesting and fun in act interacting with this setting and this rule set um so i I really like honed that down and was very um deliberate about that i think that's something that we talked about with alex roberts when we did our starcross episodes too because the starcross character sheets are very minimal there's like four questions and we talked a little bit about how some of that had to do with her background in larp too and just like honing in on the things that are important and then letting people kind of expand from there on their own Mm -hmm. and like sitting down and she talked to about the importance of like looking at a character sheet and knowing what you were going to be doing and what this game was about 
And, um, you know, because we talked about, like, D&D, you have all of your stats for fighting and, like, how am I going to kill things? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, to her, it was really important to look at a character sheet and say, what am I going to be doing in this game? And I feel like this game does a really good job of that. Mm-hmm. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's interesting because uh, I I am looking at these sheets and and, and talking about and reminding me about uh, Starcrossed and whatnot um, is making me think about my own game and how complex the sheets are there and now I got to figure Maybe out what I down. can do to pare it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think that's really tough though. In I, I mean you know, like you and I are just going to talk and Lucian can just listen for a while. Um, <laughs> But I think that's a really tough thing when you're designing something or making something um, because you really want to convey everything that you feel about it to other people. Mm -hmm. And I think paring stuff down is really tough sometimes because you don't you don't want to take things away because I think there's a worry about people misunderstanding what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you feel that way, Lucian, but, like, I feel like every time I try and put something out, I'm like, okay, I need to say all of the words and do all of the things because I want people to understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I feel, I think I have less, I think I have less of that. I think that I, um, I might have to think about this even more to, to figure out exactly how I feel about that. But, um, <laughs> we'll wait but until I, you're having one of those philosophical days and we can go. Yeah, exa it. <laughs> exactly. The next, time, the next time I'm feeling bad, I can think about this for five hours. Um, but I, I definitely um, enjoy paring things down. Like, I think it gives me a kind of, um, like, an endorphin hit to, like, um, to sort of um, hone things down to the to the core of what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like, it kind of feels like, you know, um, you know, cleaning cleaning a room, and then you're like, oh, my room's clean now. You're doing, like, like some like... Marie Kondo design, game exactly. design. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it this, this, just bring this me sparks, joy. <laughs> this sparks joy. Yeah, I think I do feel a little bit of that, where I'm just like, oh, good, there's, like, nothing, there's nothing unnecessary in my character sheet. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I, like, other people can add to it if they want, but, like, what do I, like, what do I really need to say? Like, what do I really need to give these strangers who are going to pick this up mm -hmm. so that they can like have the core experience and like have that as a jumping off point for their own creativity. Like, and what is, n what is just like not necessary for me to give them that they can come up with their own thing. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I really, I, I want, it's, it's very important to me that my games give players a feeling of having tools that will help them be creative and that will help them um, use their imaginations. So I want to give them like what they need to be able to do that and then just get out of their way. Cause I'm a stranger and they don't know me. Mm -hmm. Right. They right. have their own fantasy lives. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I mean, so kind of on that same note, how did you decide what kind of character types to put in this game like how did you decide which mall goth yeah. sort of tropes and which visigoth uh, tropes i don't know if there are tropes <laughs> are there like, visigoth <laughs> tropes you know those, uh, yeah. four, ten visigoth tropes no oh, you know yeah. what they say about those visigoths <laughs> <laughs> yeah they don't say much um yeah i i definitely wanted to um i was thinking a lot in terms of variety right so i wanted to have um a set of characters that were different enough from each other that it it gave it lets people have fun with the differences between the character types and it also gives people a wide range of options of like types that they might like to play it also gives you some replayability so you can like see what it's like to play different character types so i was really going for like what are what are some character tropes that are both fun and funny and also are different enough from each other that it's it's like entertaining to play off the differences and and switch around which ones you're playing. Mm -hmm. um, so then, like, I had those constraints, and it was like, I need things that are different enough from each other, I need things that are fun, um, and that sort of fueled a lot of how I thought about the characters and in terms of, like, balancing them out and, and stuff, right? So, like, there are a lot of things I could have done with, with mall goths, for sure, right? I could have had, like, a million different types of performers, for example, mm -hmm. right? Because I could have done, like, oh, and there's, like, you know, the theater ones and the band ones and the this ones and the that ones who are, like, all the different kinds of artists, um, which would have been true to trope and would have been true to the goth scene, but would not have made for a lot of variety 
so it wouldn't have ended up being a very interesting role playing game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, th- so that was sort of how I was thinking about it. That's very cool. Are there specific things that you felt that you needed to have as character options for this type of game? Um, wow, that's a great question. Um, needed in what sense? Like needed for like um, needed to-, to like make the genre work mm-hmm. or to like oh. evoke those feelings. Um, I mean, the answer can be no. Maybe not. I don't know. I felt I like I I did so much whittling down to like get to the core of it that I feel like everything that's left is stuff that I needed in order to express it. Yeah. So everything, everything that's left, (laughs) everything that I did not edit out in the first like 99 versions of this game. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, and I say that because I am an obsessive playtester um, and an obsessive editor of my own work. So this game, I literally had over 150 playtesters. Um, I playtested this game for a year. I brought it to conventions. I brought it like to all of my friends. I brought it to like random strangers. Um, so I playtested this 80 million times and I had like 80 million new edits and revisions mm-hmm. and, and like... I, I obsessively reworked this game. So um, everything that is not in it anymore was not necessary. <laughs> yeah. Good. That means you've done it well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what does the process of character creation in this game tell us about what playing it will be like? I love that question. Um, it definitely tells you that it's going to be whimsical, mm-hmm. I think. Right? I think you know straight off the bat from the types of questions, right? Right off the bat from, like, your Visigoths are being asked, are you still glowing from time travel? And one of the options is maybe a little. Um, like, you know that it's going to be kind of funny, tongue-in-cheek, not so serious. Um, you know that there's going to be a kind of playful antagonism when you get to the, like, assigning each other embarrassing traits. I right? Love so. Those. So much. So you, thank you so much. Like you get you get this feeling of like, oh, right, there's a rivalry here, right? It is versus, but that the rivalry isn't between the players. It's between like these funny character tropes. And it's going to be something that we can all laugh about together, not actually real like combat antagonism. Right. So you right off the bat, I think, get the get the mood of the game as being like whimsical, fun, funny, like pretty warm-hearted and good-natured even when there's conflict Mm -hmm. yeah i like having the spots on there for hurt feelings right away that like that makes it pretty clear that like what kind of you know game we're playing i like the questions that we have in there um about like having a crush on someone and Mm -hmm. um you know what kind of things you've seen them be up to and that kind of stuff just clearly sets the scene for sort of like I don't know, just, yeah, like, that interpersonal conflict, but not, like, conflict conflict. Mm, like, yeah. it's very lighthearted, like, it's very teenage conflict. The things that you <laughs> think are so important when you're 16, and then as an adult, you're like, really? I wasted so much time on that. <laughs> yes. I really wanted to get, th- I'm glad you brought that up, because I really wanted to get across the idea of, like, low stakes are high stakes, mm-hmm. right? Yes. yeah. So, like, there are a lot of things in this game where it's, like, this adventure episode is about... Um, so there's this adventure episode called um, the Little Mix Scareall Pageant um, that was written by Jonea Kemper, um, and the the stakes are like you're trying to get into this like omni goth beauty magazine but like um you're like not cool enough or old enough to go to the goth clubs yet so you're trying to like get signatures from members of this obscure band to like prove that you have goth cred right and it's like gosh that is very high stakes (laughs) right it's like low stakes are high stakes right no one's in danger it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. but but like everyone on the line (laughs) yeah you really care Mm -hmm. like i care about my reputation do i I have goth cred or am I a poser? Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to sort of get that feeling of like, these are, these are the things that are emotionally important to teenagers who are trying to like be part of a, of a scene and a subculture in the nineties. But like a lot of the stakes, you know, sometimes it gets higher stakes, but a lot of the stakes are that kind of a thing. And I think that that it translates really well, though, because I, you know, we talked a little bit before, like, I was not part of the goth subculture, and honestly, was not a teenager in the 90s. But I still can very much, like, 
I can still very much understand that and remember, like, how things felt at that point of, like, being part of a subculture and feeling like everything was so important and all of that kind of stuff that, like, you didn't have to be a goth. You didn't have to be, you know, a mall goth in the 90s to, like, feel what you're trying to do here because it still feels very much like the quintessential teenage experience Mm -hmm. that we all had of, like... Oh, this is so important, and I just need to fit in. <laughs> yeah, like, am I cool? Yes or no? Right. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes, no, maybe, and maybe yeah. being, like, the absolute worst answer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nothing is worse than maybe. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So, the the, the fun question... Um, what do you think is the uh, the one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system, uh, or uh, what are you most proud of? Flaws. Um, I guess if you are the kind of player who really wants everything um, spelled out for you, which there are those kinds of players, right? Mm-hmm. If if you are the kind of player who really wants to know, like what is my aerobics ability, right? What is like exactly quantifiably, like how good am I at herbalism, right? Mm-hmm. If you're the kind of player who's, who the fun that you get from a role playing game is for, from knowing that kind of like minute detail and quantified in numbers of exactly how good you are at everything. And like, want to know precisely like mechanically how all of that stuff works. Um, then this game's character creation and its mechanisms are not going to satisfy that desire, right? It's not a good match for that desire mm-hmm. um, because the the style of play for Visigoths versus Malgoths is, first of all, much more improvisational than strategic. Um, so while there are elements of the characters and of the way dice rolling works and, and the mechanisms that are... Um, a little crunchier, right? Have some, some, you know, numeric and luck based stuff, right? And all of that mechanical stuff. Um, it is lighter on that stuff than some games. Um, and if that kind of a thing is what brings you joy and what is aesthetically satisfying for you in role playing games, it's just not going to satisfy that need. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that's a weakness of the game or of its design, but I think that it's, um, definitely something to know if that is the specific thing that you enjoy most about role playing games. Um, it doesn't have that um, in the way that you might want if that's your thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not everything is for everyone and that's yeah. okay. Um, and that's fine with me. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, I will say that even if you do like that kind of a game um, and you're interested in the setting of Visigoths versus Malgoths, you can just port over the setting um, to some other game. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you want to use the mall, which is a fully developed mall with a full set of NPCs and a full set of items that you can buy and you just want to port over the mall of Visigoths versus Malgoths and play it in, you know, Vampire the Masquerade or Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, Burning Wheel or whatever you want to play it in, right? Um, it won't hurt my feelings if you still buy my game. I don't care, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, even if even if the mechanics of this are not your taste for the type of role-playing game that you like, obviously they are my taste. That's why I made it this way. But if they're not your taste, but you still want to play in my 90s mall of Visigoths and Malgoths, feel free um, to buy my game and just use the setting for something else. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, some, some game designers, I think that would hurt their feelings, but it it doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's, I mean, obviously, you know, those creative types, but I think that like, there's some level of like, Hey, you at least appreciate part of the thing that I made and like something about what I did resonated with you. Yeah, but I mean, I, there's also a level of like, mm, don't touch my thing. I pu- I made it this way for a reason. <laughs> yeah, know? totally. I mean, I just, I really just want to give people tools to use their imaginations and and have fun. Right. So like I obviously have a design perspective, right. And I have, um, you know, sorts of experiences that I am hoping to deliver to people through the mechanics and through the systems. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you don't like that, right, you can still use my setting. Like I, it's fine. Like I want you to have a rich fantasy life and have fun with your friends. Right. So that's, that's still more important to me. Mm -hmm. It's funny because uh, 
you you were talking about that, and I was thinking like I have a very uh, min max sort of brain from mm-hmm. uh, from my nineties role playing with Palladium and whatnot. Um, yeah, and and pretty much any like video game RPG that I approach, I always try to min max because that's just the way my brain works sometimes. Uh, yeah, when I was going through character creation for the Cyber Pet. Um, I saw one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the options for the um, embarrassing traits for a Visigoth was the uh, fear of animals. Uh-huh. Was like if I wanted to min max, because then because then I could just play off of that throughout the game. Yeah, and uh, and have an advantage over this Visigoth character. Yeah, um, but I didn't go that way because. I thought Bad Dancer was much better. I saw the option of, like, bad taste in music, too, and I thought about giving you that, and then I could just blame my bad dancing on, actually, it's just your bad taste in music. It's not that I can't dance. It's that you listen to the wrong kind of music. Yep. So. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the thing about min-maxing, because I actually think um, there's sort of, like, a fun fun result if you try to do that in Visigoths versus Malgoths. Like, let's say, for example, you decided, right, you're playing a um, a Visigoth. Sorry, you're playing a Malgoth, and you're like, oh, I'm going to min-max. I'm going to, like try to screw over my my um my visigoth you know friend over here by giving them fear of animals Mm -hmm. especially if there's something like a conqueror where they might have um the the skill of control animals Mm. um but what's what ends up happening in play right is if you're a visigoth and you're a conqueror and you have both control animals and fear of animals you now have even more opportunities to use your embarrassing traits to help other people on your side (laughs) (laughs) so you end up having like funny double binds like that where it's like well like it it is it is unfortunate for the character yeah. right that they are both a, like a visigoth conqueror who controls animals and are afraid of animals but mechanically it could actually be advantageous <laughs> very nice <laughs> <laughs> haha take that notes exactly <laughs> also it's funny like that's the thing like i'm not i'm not tricking you to like give you a bad time um right. i'm tricking you to give you a good time mm-hmm. like it's actually really funny and fun for everyone when there is a conqueror visigoth who is controlling animals and afraid of animals <laughs> like it's actually really really funny that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh wait i lost my spot in our outline here we're at, we're at your favorite part Oh, my favorite part. It's time for my favorite part, everyone. It's the fan fiction section. Oh, my Um, God, yes. We started this question originally as, like, let's talk about our group's cohesion and how we would fare in a typical session. You know, like, let's talk about party balance. And then pretty soon we realized that, like, we never actually talked about that. We just talked about what we would want to happen in this game if we ever actually played it. So now we have dubbed it the fanfic section. Um, That's amazing. Let's talk about what would happen with these terrible teens. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, first of all, what's what's the crush? There's a crush. Um, yeah, uh, my character Luna has a, ch- a crush on uh, Jelvira. Yeah, and I saw you uh, writing bad poetry on the wall. So mm-hmm. that's true. My poetry is great. I don't know what you're it's talking terrible. about. It's terrible. It's terrible. It is not the right number of. <laughs> Nobody syllables. understands my soul. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I also have another question. So I know that um, that. Um, Luna wants to be Velvet's pet. Mm-hmm. Is it? Is it? Is it purely for like role playing? Is it romantic? Ooh. Right? Is it like what? In what manner does I, Luna want to be? I want to say Velvet's pet. I want to say it's uh, it's more of a role playing thing. Um, to uh, kind of kind of because then then she kind of has like this built in friend. But also yeah. because she she likes having the the new fun toys that you make. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that Velvet, um, I think that Velvet is enough of like a self absorbed like dramatic theater boy that he doesn't understand this, right? I think that I think that Velvet, oh. I think that Velvet would would think that Luna has a crush on him, mm. but not be interested. Right, like Luna would just be like, like very arrogant about like, like oh, you know this this um, this cyber pet like totally has a crush on me, but I'm like a cool vampire theater guy, and he'd be kind of a snob about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that I so I think 
Gilvira really resents Velvet for stealing the cape look, but I think is <laughs> secretly feels like maybe he pulls it off better than her and is like oh. kind of into that. Oh, brutal. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think really what I'm saying here is that if there's not a love triangle, we're not playing this game correctly. <laughs> exactly. There has to be a love triangle. And also, I mean, the, the thing that's fun about this is um, this game is technically for four to six, four to six players mm-hmm. plus GM, right? So, oh, by the way, the GM is called the mall rat. Um, yes. So it's four to four to six players plus the mall rat. Um, so with even more of us, right, there would surely also be additional, like, love, you know, it would be like a love pentagon or oh, whatever. Yeah, easily. Yeah. Or a love pentagram, I, I should say. I was going to say, pentagram. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, love pentagram. Um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely a love triangle, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you're playing this game correctly, there has to be. I, yeah. I have, I think my pinned tweet right now actually is something about how if you don't have a shopping scene in your RPG, you are playing RPGs wrong. Yes. So this game is perfect. This game um, has at least six shopping scenes. Right. <laughs> I mean, it has shopping right in the right in the title. Yes. Mall. Well, mall and not shopping. But you know what yeah. I mean, okay? It's fine. No, I, I think that I, I think there's the potential for some very high drama. Mm-hmm. And um, at, at least one school dance. Yeah, um, for sure. Because mm-hmm. if there's not a school dance, I don't think you're doing it correctly either. Uh, I also think that given given Velvet's history of lighting things on fire, um, I think there's definitely going to be a fire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, for sure. There has to be at least like one to three arsons. Exactly. Like, I feel like there's going to be a situation where like, you know, some of these crushes or love triangles like come to a, a dramatic peak and Velvet just starts lighting things mm-hmm. on fire and it becomes like uh, a whole And then the sprinklers fire. go off and it ruins my cape. Exactly. Oh. It maybe it overflows. This is dry the, clean only. <laughs> <laughs> it overflows the fountain. Um, oh. You know all kinds of problems. Oh yes, yeah. This is very good. There's a lot of potential here for things to go terribly, terribly Absolutely. wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially sure. once you start adding a few more, a few more goths in here. Yeah. More goths and goths. <laughs> yes, goths and goths. <laughs> oh, I I love this. I love our people. Uh, we made great people. We did. We did These a are fantastic great people, job. For sure. And I hope that, you know, when the game comes out, you know, that, that you get a chance to play with um with these characters. Oh yeah. Yeah, I really want to. I, I bought the game. I'm I'm waiting yes. when it gets here and it's on my yes. shelf. And then it becomes one of the books that I look at longingly and think, someday I'll have time to play. <laughs> yeah. Totally. But I can still make characters. Right. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, well, it's 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 getting there. It is currently with the um with the stylistic editor slash copy editor. So it's really um Ooh. in late stages of of development. It goes from there to um to graphic design and layout. But all of the templates are already made. It just needs to be actually nice. the text put in that, and then it goes to print. So we're we're getting there. Ooh, so close! Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. So. Let's go on to our final segment, uh, which I love to call Take It Up a Level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Uh, which I hate I, it. I know Amelia hates. <laughs> <laughs> well, normally in this segment, we, we talk about um, character advancement, leveling up and, and whatnot. But this game doesn't really have that sort of mechanic to it. Uh, did you want to talk about why to leave out? Why why you left out character advancement? I would love to talk about why I left out character advancement. This was a deliberate choice. Um, So first of all, you can play this as a one shot. You can play this as a series, um, as a campaign. Um, In fact, uh, it works very well to play um, all six of the pre-written adventures in order as a, as a um, plot arc. Um, I say in the book, um, there is no character advancement. There is no experience points. Um, the mall is, um, as in real life, always just as hazardous as the very first time. Um, and that's sort of the core of, of why I did this. I feel like if, if we're staying in genre, right, if we're staying in the idea of like, this is like a teen movie, mm-hmm. it's like a 90s teen movie or a 90s sitcom, and um, we're dealing with like, romance and like mall antics and shoplifting and like maybe some fights right um 
it is not actually the case when you are a teenager, like hanging out in these mall settings, that you somehow get better at being a teenager in the mall <laughs> as you as you do this over time, right? It just isn't, right? That's like the quintessential fact about te- being a teenager is it does not get better. <laughs> no, it doesn't get any better. You just eventually age out of it, and then you're in a different part of your life, right? So I wanted to to sort of capture the sense of like what you're doing here is not trying to get better or hone skills or like become a hero or gain mastery. That's like not the point of this activity, right? Because that's not what any of us were ever doing when we were teenagers hanging out in malls, having like our terrible dramatic interpersonal problems or like trying to like buy weird jewelry or whatever. Right. So, so the idea is that, you know, as you as you go through your experiences in this mall and these different like plot arcs and dramatic arcs and and you know have all these all of these things happen to you um it's not that you get any better at it, right? It's not that you somehow become a a more honed, you know, machine of navigating teen life in the mall, right? It's always just as hard. Um, and all of the other people in the mall, right, are continuing to have their lives and it, none of you are really getting any better at what you're doing, <laughs> right? So I, I wanted to keep that and I think it, I think it adds to, um, it adds, I think, to the comedy, right? It's like, well you know, what have we done here, right? We've rescued this this mall goth who's been, who's been captured by a Visigoth and we've tried to either do or not do some of the things on this purity test. And like, we, maybe we got dates to this dance, but like, what, what did this do? Right. What, how did this enrich us? Did this make us better people? No, it didn't make us better people. (laughs) Absolutely not. It did not make us more charismatic. It didn't make us stronger. It didn't make us wiser, right? We're going to go back to the mall next Saturday and we're going to be just as awkward and embarrassed and inept and, and make terrible choices and like have all kinds of hijinks happen as we would have last time before any of this happened. Right. And that's what it means to be a teenager. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so good. That's so good. I love it. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Thank you. I've so that's a better, a better reasoning for like, not, you're just not going to get better. It's no, just you're just like... not getting any better at anything you're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, it's so sad and so true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. For, for some reason, I was picturing like a leveling up mechanic where literally you just gain a level and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you are now level two. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, really. It's just like now you're 17. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now you are a sophomore. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, Lucian, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Visigoths versus Malgoths. This was really great. Thanks so much for having me, and I hope you enjoy the game when it comes this out. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you and this game and what sort of things that you're working on as well? Yes. So I am Lucian Khan. Um, it is L U C I A N K A H N. Um, Khan like Madeline, not like Genghis. Um, <laughs> and um, you can find me upon the internet, um, especially on Twitter um, at O Theogony, which is O H underscore. T-H-E-O-G-O-N-Y. Um, you can find Visigoths versus Malgoths available for pre-order now um, on Backer Kit. Um, the easiest way to find it is to just Google Visigoths versus Malgoths. It's the only one. Um, and you will eventually see both the Kickstarter, which double funded, yay, and the Backer Kit place for pre-orders, um, where you can place pre-orders for either um, the hard copy and PDF together or just the PDF. Um, So those are both available for pre-order. And um, you can find my other games in a variety of places. Um, Dead Friend, a game of necromancy, is available on the internet at itch.io. You can go to necromancy.itch.io. It is also available in a variety of stores, um, including 20-sided store in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, um, and a variety of other stores. Um, and, um, grandma's drinking song is coming up soon. Um, it will be in Doi Kite, a, um, TTRPG anthology. Also, um, if you are an adult, look out for Honey and Hot Wax by, uh, coming out from Pelgrane Press, um, somewhere near the end of 2020. I am, uh, the co-editor on that project along with, um, Sharing Biswas. Nice. Yes. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone for listening, and we will be back next week. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like The Broadswords. The Broadswords is an all-woman D&D podcast focused on drama, roleplay, and subverting stereotypes. Join the broads as they unravel the mystery of Snowy Rashomon, a land ruled by witches and steeped in superstition. Berserkers reign and spirits roam the frozen wastes. Yularis, Kila, Mipri all have their own reasons for journeying north, but they soon find they have something in common. They are pawns in a divine plot. Yay! Yay! We did Excellent. it! We did it! And you didn't forget to record! So. I didn't forget to record. It's going. <laughs> Huzzah. All right. Podcast done. <laughs> Check, we did it. We survived. Great job, everyone. Yes. See you next week. All right. I'm a little cold in my studio this morning. What? I know. I'm a little. I'm a little warm in my kitchen. Oh. <laughs> I'm in. And my bedroom is so. just right. No, actually, it's, I'm a little cold too, but that's fine. So I'm wearing a sweatshirt over I, a sweater. I gotta stop wearing like short sleeve shirts in the basement. I have a, a little bit of an overactive radiator. Um, it's also like one of the clunky kinds that sounds like there's gnomes working inside it. Mm. Love those. Yeah, it's it's very um, it's it, there's like a romantic quality f- to it for sure, but it is a little bit warm in here. <laughs> you know, a little bit of uh, background noise. Let me turn down my gain a little bit. There we go. Mine's like all the way down, and it still picks up noise. Yeah. I gotta get one of those fancy microphones like you have. You can have. turn down the gain in, in Audacity, too. I know. I tried that, though, and then it was it was real wonky. Oh, it was okay. doing weird stuff. Let's not like, worry about it, then. <laughs> I'm, gonna per- I'm gonna pretend I know what those things mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I googled it once, okay? <laughs> it's like, it's actually, it should be embarrassing, because I have been a professional musician before, but I just am, I'm very, um, I'm a very low embarrassment person, so oh, I don't yeah, feel, I don't feel embarrassed, even though I should. That's good, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's plenty of things that, like, so many of us spend so much time worrying about that really, we could all just be a lot happier if we just didn't care. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, then there's obviously other things that we maybe should care more about, but. Ab- absolutely, but. You know. Someday we'll find that happy medium. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. You're uh, orange, right? Yeah, I'm orange. 
Okay. Right, I not... say as if we haven't been doing this for two years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's fine. It's fine. Well, I had the same uh, crisis last time, so I think, oh, yeah, I think that's we're right. even now. We did talk about that, how that one time we tried to switch colors and it messed everything up. Uh-huh. I, I wrote myself a few tiny notes, but mostly I'm I'm just winging it and hopefully I remember who I am and what I do. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, all I mean can, that's all any of us can hope exactly. for. Exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, all right. Woo! Did it. Hooray. I'm going to move my microphone in front of my face now, even. Look that would that. help. It would. You'd think that, but <laughs> you can't prove it. Well, you can. Cause, <laughs> okay, cause, cause whatever, the audio Ryan. quality is not as good. <laughs> okay, if you say so. I guess with editing magic. Fix it in post. <laughs>